Good morning, everybody. So, hi, I'm Chen, and I'm an engineering director at Google, and I'm leading the development of some of the open source technologies you already heard about, Kubernetes and also Istio, and also responsible for some of our products like Google Kubernetes Engine. And I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this is already my favorite event of the year by choosing this amazing location uh, and the weather. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to meet many of you and speak about the things that we are all very passionate about. Today is a very, very special day for the Kubernetes community and also for the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Uh, today we announced that Kubernetes is being graduation, uh, graduating from incubation as the first project out of CNCF. Yay! <laughs> Graduation is a signal of maturity of a project. Uh, from the early days, when the Google engineering team started to work on Kubernetes, uh, they collaborated with people from companies like Red Hat and CoreOS, and, and also customers like Box, and, and everybody worked together, uh, bringing different perspective, ideas, skills, experience, and really building this technology uh, uh, with the goal to solve, right? Uh, speaking to what uh, Jim said before, really solve problems for users uh, wherever they are. Uh, and what was amazing that not only uh, we got many contributions, but because of the nature of the community and, and the openness, we were also able to build a really rich ecosystem around that, filling the gap uh, where it's needed. So some metrics of how success looks like. I just added it this morning with the GitHub stars, and probably we'll need to do it again after this, after today. And luckily, users are recognizing it, the success of Kubernetes, the st stability of this project. And this is really, if you look on the CNCF of what graduation means, it means a, a governance model. It talks about more than one contributor. But on top of everything, it's about users using it in production. And this is definitely uh, not the entire list, and uh, new users using Kubernetes every day. Uh, and what I love about it, and it's not shown here, that all of us contributing to Kubernetes are also using Kubernetes. As an example, for Google itself, we are building Google Kubernetes Engine using upstream Kubernetes. We have products like CloudML running on GKE uh, internally. Uh, and that's what makes it better, because we all benefit from that technology. And benefits include, of course, agility. That's what drives everything. This is what drives adoption uh, today. And agility is measured with how quickly you can deploy to production, how quickly you can set up environments with the complexity of multiple workloads and, and infrastructure, uh, leveraging cloud-native technologies. This is something that really Kubernetes is putting a goal for, and definitely CNCF, making it easy to adopt those, to, to, those technology without the need to modernize everything uh, already. And the pace of adoption also keeps us on the edge as a community, really trying to innovate and, and meet the demand of our customers. So how did we get here? Right? This is why we are here. This is the intention of this entire uh, week, to talk about how can you build a successful project like Kubernetes. So when Dan sent me an, e uh, an email, said like, hey, Chen, can you come and speak uh, in the Open Source Leadership Summit? And I was like, yes, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, like, if you can just tell everybody how you made it work, and that will be great. <laughs> like, well, I wish I could. Uh, the truth is that the world is changing very fast. Okay, and the days Kubernetes was started four years ago. So maybe for some of you, it seems like it was overnight. It wasn't overnight. It has been four years of working and adapting to the pace of, of technology and the industry. So there is no playbook. Uh, but definitely, there are some really great memories. And like every graduation, I want to uh, walk you some, to some of them and talk about some of the learnings. So how do you balance between open source and non-open source investment? If only I had a dollar, every time someone asked me that, I would probably not be standing here, and I would be vacationing maybe in Hawaii or something, somewhere else. And this comes up from everybody, from customers, from engineers that want to join the team, from product management, executives. There is real tension, because it's really hard to rationalize. So you are taking all this IP and making it uh, available to everybody. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with this challenge. In my, in my mind, one of the choices that we did in Google, within my team, 
is decided that open source is part of the strategy. It's not a side gig. It's not something we just take outside. It was part of the strategy from the beginning. Right? If you will read the origin story of Kubernetes, it was about getting adoption. It was about getting feedback. It was about building an ecosystem. We have made a decision that Kubernetes upstream is the core technology that we are building our products on. So if you are investing in Kubernetes, you are literally also investing in GKE at the same time. And what I found is that if you explain developers in particular that our users are benefiting from open source, okay, they are benefiting from the fact that Kubernetes runs everywhere. It helps them solve problems. That helps solve that tension. Okay, because we are not doing it just for the sake of the tech or just uh, to make something cool open source. We are really helping our users. And this is a journey, right? And that journey to moving to cloud will be a long one. And for many of the customers, there will always be that hybrid environment. Another point I want to talk specifically about uh, for all uh, the engineering managers here. One thing that was important for me is also to build one team. There is no open source team and a product team. There is one team. There is one strategy, one backlog, one team. And I believe that throughout the years, GKE has benefited so, benefited so much with working with the Kubernetes users. But also the other way around. I know that Kubernetes, the project, benefited from the experience that we have gathered with our GKE customers. So this is my first community meeting. It was almost two years ago. So community meeting in Kubernetes every Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We are meeting, we are inviting everybody from the community. Everything is recorded, <laughs> available on YouTube, of course. And we talk. We talk about things. We talked about a project, ecosystem, demos. And you can imagine, so this is like probably my second month in Google, um, it can be very intimidating, okay, going up and, and speaking about something. And this was, you know, I can still remember, right? I remember speaking for the first time and I had Dale Bryan cheering for me and saying, it's going to be okay. And this was in the, in the middle of 1.3 uh, Kubernetes release. And in this particular example, we were debating whether to reduce uh, the amount of development in favor of stabilization. And the reason we did it is because, at least I in particular, we wanted to increase our release cadence and make it stable and get to the point that if you miss the train, you can always catch the next one and really build that release train. And today, Kubernetes is releasing every three months or 100 days and really improved on that. And I think from this example, there are two things that everybody can learn on. Engineering and management practices. We saw some questions before. How do you manage open source? How do you uh, prioritize? I really believe that there is actually shouldn't be any difference from the way you manage an open source product and an engineering team to the way you uh, manage your own uh, commercial product or your own product itself. Those engineering practices, agile, release cadence, defining the quality bar, testing, documentation, stabilization period, marketing, all of those things, they are all needed for an open source project if you want it to be successful. And this is definitely something that we had in our mind doing Kubernetes. And it feels like one engineering team. The other point yes. is transparency. While it might be intimidating to be recorded all the time and everything is visible to everybody, but it also empowers people to speak and join the conversation because you can go and look on what was before and what decisions were made and what alternatives were considered. So for me, while it was a bit hard, I also felt in, that it was encouraging uh, to have new people join the conversation. And really, it helps to build trust. And trust, like any other team, whether if it's engineering, product marketing, or in any other industry, trust is key to build a team that works together. This was another uh, exciting moment. So I'm pretty sure that I don't need to uh, introduce Pokemon Go. 
So it was uh, around July 2016, and the entire world was walking like that, and all the kids were walking like that. How many here played Pokemon Go? <laughs> so I didn't, because it, was, it is running on GKE, and I was afraid to add more load. But <laughs> other than that, <laughs> And I was like telling the team, like, don't play, don't play. <laughs> um, but this was exciting times. Okay, so the entire world, there was this crazy excitement about Pokemon Go, and we couldn't tell anyone that it runs on GKE, that it runs on Kubernetes. Uh, and you can see here, this is one of, of the graphs that they published about how the traffic that uh, they had was 50 times what they expected. 50 times. You can see the graph. And, and that could have become a, a successful disaster. But instead, because of cloud native technologies, because of technologies like Kubernetes, they were able to scale the cluster as the demand grew without uh, interrupting the way they sell the users. Uh, and in my mind, this is something that is also very important in any open source project, in any open source product. Focus on the user. What problems are you solving? What is the pain that you need to solve? Um, something that I love about the Kubernetes community is that we are very pragmatic. We're not trying to look for the perfect solution. We're trying to solve problems for users and make sure that it's practical and they can use it. Uh, one concrete example would be uh, when Kubernetes 1.0 was announced, it supported 100 node clusters. This is not a Google scale cluster, right? It's only 100 nodes. But for that time, that was the right size for people that wants to kick the tire and try their technology. If we would have tried to do Google scale like Kubernetes, we would probably be blocked forever. But as time went by and we got more things in, we improved on that, and today we have 5,000 nodes. A cluster. And to be honest with you, that 100 node cluster is still a good fit for many of the users of Kubernetes today. And that's what makes it relevant uh, for many uh, customers and users. And celebrate success. The success of Pokemon Go was not just my team or just Google's. Everybody that worked on Kubernetes to build that contributed to Pokemon Go. And that was a celebration for the entire community, just to show some of that success. Uh, but not everything in open source is rainbow and butterfly. I wish, but no. Um, so when we started to talk about Kubernetes and talk about the culture, we talked about the values and transparency and respect. And it was easy when the community was 600 people. But then it became 1,200 and then 1,500 and then 2,000, and then 3,000, and from three companies contributing to 10, to 20, and more, and it becomes more complex. Uh, and in particular, like again, like any other organization, when you scale, you need to react, and you need to think about what do you change in order to meet uh, the new scale. Uh, one specific problem we had was with processes. When everybody knew everybody, it was easy to make decisions, so we had this idea was, hey, we, we have those SIGs, we have special interest groups, they meet and they make decisions and it's all great. But then we have some new people that are joining and they don't know who's that person, who is the SIG lead. And why that person get to make the decision and not I am. And now if I want to contribute, how can I engage and how can I improve my leadership and become a leader of this community? And this is, again, another signal of the graduation today, uh, is working on, about, on our governance model. Uh, in October 2017, we elected our steering committee. And the steering committee is not about making all the decisions. It's about ensuring there is a way to make decisions. There is a way to escalate. There is a way to challenge. Um, just the other day, Sarah Navadny published the values of the Kubernetes community. Before. We all knew the values, but this is not good enough anymore. We have to document it so people that want to join our community know what are the things that we work by. Scaling is not just about processes. You also need to scale the technology. It was around uh, also the end of 2016 when we 
felt that we, there is a velocity uh, hit. It was harder to innovate. You would change something here and something broke there. Uh, you needed, there was hard to get reviewers for everything. And really nobody was able to understand the entire complexity of the system. So if you look on this slide, uh, Brian Grant created this diagram to capture the scope of Kubernetes, the complexity of it. It's almost uh, the same of an entire cloud provider. So about that time, what we decided to do, and I wish, by the way, that we have done more uh, at the beginning of it, is really investing in what are the extension points to Kubernetes. And anyone that is now thinking about a new open source project, talking about interoperability, uh, like you mentioned before, it is critical. So while it might seem for people that it's not that important and we can wait with that, extension points are critical and they are key for su uh, sustainable success. So as you're looking on those layers, there are over a dozen extension points today. And naming few are webhooks, a CRI, a container runtime interface, a client libraries, cloud providers. And what's amazing about it, that it helps us to innovate and build new things. Uh, for example, Open Service Broker, Istio, uh, and there are some really uh, awesome uh, serverless framework that are already using those extensions, and that allows them to innovate uh, even faster. Conformance. Just uh, three months ago, we announced the uh, certification uh, conformance program for Kubernetes. Because having those extension points is not enough. We wanted to make sure that we reduce the risk of fragmentation. Okay, we are planning for success. So how can customers, partners, make sure that this is upstream Kubernetes, that the entire uh, API uh, interface is usable and available for you to use. And, and that was amazing, because this was a community effort, and that really represents one of the values of the Kubernetes community, which is community before product, community before company. Because for a single company, that might not be the most important thing, but as a community, we want to make sure that Kubernetes will stay for a very long time, and we'll keep hearing about it uh, in many years to come. So right now, I think there are about 20-something. Today, there are over 50 companies that are compliant with uh, uh, the conformance program. So what can you learn about everything that we have done with Kubernetes? The first thing is intentional leadership. You have to plan. To plan. Nothing happens just by doing stuff or not being thoughtful about what is our goal. Uh, what's your open source strategy? What is your expectation from the community? What is the release process? How do you ensure quality? Invest time and think about it and make sure that your actions are aligned with your intentions. And if they are not, change your actions. We all make mistakes and we make experiments. But definitely uh, be intentional about everything. What are the culture values that you want to have in the community? Sustainable success. What got us here won't get us there. <laughs> Plan for success. Plan for the future. What needs to be changed in order to be uh, successful, to update, uh, to react to the amount of adoption that took us by surprise? But we adopted and we changed and we were open-minded about what needs to change and how we move forward. Uh, and I know for sure that everything we are planning for the next year, we'll again have to change, assuming we'll be successful in two years and three years. And that's how product is, how software is, how technology is. Everything changes also around us. The last point is diversity. I didn't talk about it uh, before within my slide. Uh, being a female le leader in tech, it's not easy to talk about diversity. But I think that as leaders, we all must talk about diversity. So my ask from all of you is to be intentional about that. Build communities with openness that are welcoming people. So my uh, personal belief that every project, every team, every product will benefit from a diverse team. The unique thing about open source is that it is in the reach of everybody. No matter your age, 
where you, which country you live in, or your gender. You can all be part of something amazing. And it's really a platform of opportunities for everybody. And I think for all of us, it's really an opportunity to make this a better world. So thank you. <laughs>